some of you may have come to my uh, lecture um, a couple of I, I lose count of the lectures. Um, sign of being that's a sign of being old. Um, but uh, some of you may have come to my lecture. I think it was the last, but one, the last here. Uh, the last one was about incest. Um, you've probably forgotten. And the one before was about the evolution of God. And uh, the evolution of God, well, I actually introduced with this very useful little uh, slide here, uh, <clears throat> which is an image of uh, something which is a statue that stood on the, um, on the uh, staircase in the University of Edinburgh Zoology Department where I was a student. And it's a very useful kind of image because, as you'll see, I can use it to introduce a totally different lecture. Right? <laughs> um, okay. And what it is, for those of you who didn't go to the, my earlier lecture, what it's a picture of a chimpanzee. It's called Epf mit Schädel. It's in the ape with the skull. It's a German uh, 1950s um, uh, object, and it's a picture of a chimpanzee with a very puzzled expression on its face, um, sitting on a pile of books, and if you look more carefully, I'm looking at a human skull in its hand, and if you look more carefully, you'll see that one of the books has uh, the title Darwin on the spine the, of the author, and on the open page, you might just be able to make out the words Eretus, Secret, and Deus. Well, all of you, of course, at Gresham College, I know it's uh, daily language used in the office, given when it was found that it's, of course, Latin. Um, and uh, so I don't need to translate that for you all, but I will, I will for those few who've come to, who, 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 don't, who are not uh, expert cla classicists. It means it's from the Vulgate, it's from the Roman Catholic um, version of the Bible, Genesis, and it, it's, uh, it means, and ye shall be like, it, it's from the phrase, um, eritus secret deus, ye shall be like gods knowing of good and evil. And it comes from uh, Genesis uh, chapter one, uh, book one, where the, the serpent tempts Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. With that statement, if the day you eat the fruit thereof, you should be like gods, knowing of good and evil. And eat, uh, Eve, of course, eats the fruit, um, and Eve and Adam notice immediately that they are um, unclothed, um, and uh, they, um, they, they um, uh, then commit the first and least original of all sins by having sex, and they have children, of course, Cain and Abel. God gets annoying, understandably annoyed by them, and chucks them out into the real world. Okay. And actually, in Christian theology, that was the origin of, that was the source of original sin. That was the sin that besmirched us all. The, the, perhaps the, the, the least original of all sins, which is the discovery of sex, um, that's, uh, we're paying the price now in our own inherited imperfection. And many people see genetics as being a bit like that, a kind of inborn original sin, an imperfection with which we're all marked, not because of some mythic thing that happened 4004 BC, but because of the accumulation of biochemical errors over time. Um, and to some extent that's true, and that notion of, uh, of uh, in human imperfection is deeply embedded within our psyche. Um, you can see it again and again, not just in the story of the Garden of Eden, but all the way to the present day. When people, for example, believe that uh, uh, intelligence or criminality or wisdom or stupidity or musicality are all embedded in the genes. Um, the biggest put down I ever heard to that notion, which really summarizes my lecture, I went a few years ago to a lecture by Daniel Barenboim, um, it was a wreath lecture, and it was a hilarious event because he hadn't, he hadn't, um, he hadn't uh, prepared anything at all. And he was being interviewed by Sue Lawley. And she was desperately trying to make the thing go along. And uh, she opened it to the questions of the floor. And somebody stood up and said, um, Mr. Barenboim, have you ever met uh, somebody like you who was a child prodigy? And he said, oh, no, no, never met anybody like me who was a child prodigy. But I've met plenty of their parents. <laughs> <laughs> And there is a tendency to assume that actually we are born the way we are. And that's what I want to explain, the question of, um, of disentangling nature from nurture. Can we do that? And if we do that, um, what, if anything, does it tell us about um, inborn fate? Well, I start my first year lectures at UCL, uh, which I've just given my... 38th one today in that series um, by asking the students to look to the person to their left and the person to their right. And I say, you might like to repeat the experiment, and I say with some accuracy that two out of the three of them will die for reasons connected to the genes they carry. And for some reasons they find it funny. I guess they're young enough to find it funny, okay? <laughs> we, we clearly are not, um, uh, okay? 
And then I say, and that's accurate, they, and I'm quite what that means, I'll come back to in a moment. But then I say, cheer up, if I'd been giving this lecture in Shakespeare's time, two out of every three of you would be dead already. <laughs> and here are the pictures, the figures of life and death for children born in England um, in, uh, in, uh, who made it to be, chances of making it to be 21. And in, in, in 1601, when Shakespeare was alive, uh, it was about one in three. In 1801, just before Charles Darwin, eight years before Darwin was born, it wasn't much more than one in two. In 2001, it was 98.9%. It's now probably about 99.1%. Okay. Um, and of course, we all have to die at the end, though. In the old days, we used to die, as this museum, of course, will show us. We died from the enemy that came from outside, from cholera, from cold, from starvation, from violence, all these things which really were the plague of London. And in the last, year, last five years, of course, have been utterly banished by government decree. So they've gone, okay. But now we, do, we die, in the words of a now forgotten politician, we die from the enemy within, okay. Uh, yeah, things like cancer, diabetes and heart disease all have a strong genetic component. But quite what that means is perhaps rather more subtle than many people think. Can we, sef can we separate nature from nurture? Oddly enough, the phrase nature and nurture is itself a Shakespearean phrase. It comes from the tempest, and on Prospero's Island, where they're shipwrecked, of course you know, there lives this awful uh, little monster called Caliban, which they try to be, the shipwrecked sailors and Prospero himself, try to be, try to be kind to, and Caliban refuses to listen to them at all, and carries on being utterly revolting. And in great exasperation, one of the sailors says to, Cal says to Caliban, on thy foul nature, nurture will never stick. In other words, you were born so awful that there's nothing we can do about it. Well, my suggestion is that actually uh, that is a hopelessly naive view of the way that nature and nurture work. They always work together. It's a very malign view because it actually has led to some very malign political policies. Here's a chap I always like to show pictures of, Francis Galton. Galton was Charles Darwin's cousin. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, and he left a large sum of money to University College of London in 1911 um, to found what was then rather embarrassingly called the National Laboratory of Eugenics. Um, we changed the title rather quickly, I have to tell you. Um, and uh, he was interested in being well-born, okay? Eugenics, that's what it means. And he wrote in 18, uh, 1871, he wrote a book called Hereditary Genius where he put out the case that actually genius was inherited, as was stupidity, as was anything else you could think of. He, he, worked, he worked out, for example, that rowing ability on the Tem, on the, uh, on the Tyne was uh, inherited. The ability to be a boxer was inherited. The ability to be a sea captain was inherited. And of course, that's true to some broad sense. If your father was a sea captain, you're more likely to become a sea captain and all the way back into history. That's true, but he sort of saw automatically that this was embedded into the human, uh, the very human uh, psyche. It was in the genes, as we'd say today. And he was interested overwhelmingly in, in quality, and he came up with the notion, indeed, that human quality was in danger of decline. Because geniuses, people like him, had fewer children than people um, of lower ability. Um, one of the things he did, and I think I've probably mentioned this before to this audience, was to take one odd measure of quality, which is to look at beauty, female beauty. And we still own the little brass counting device he held in the palm of his hand and walked from, went from British city to British city, kept scoring the local females on a five-point scale from attractive to repulsive. Um, <laughs> Uh, the low point was in Aberdeen. <laughs> Not much has changed. Um, and the high point is where it still is, outside, South Ke outside Harrods in South Kensington. Okay. <laughs> but that was his view. And his view was, in many ways, taken up with enthusiasm and gave rise to the eugenics movement. And I don't want to talk at any length about the eugenics movement, um, but it was a movement that led to great, vile policies, uh, some of which, the remnants of which, are still with us. It led, of course, directly to the horrors of Germany in the 1930s. But people tend to forget that Sweden was equivalently uh, involved in eugenics. Tens of thousands of young people in Sweden were sterilized. In the United States, fewer were sterilized, but you could be sterilized for shoplifting in 
some states in the United States. Okay. It's really rather strange that it never had any influence in Britain. Um, Winston Churchill in 1917 stood up in the House of Commons and asked for a sterile, compulsory sterilisation law. And an MP called Wedgwood, one of the descendants of the great Wedgwood, gave a, a, an impassioned account that the statement that that, wasn't, that that was unethical. So oddly enough, in the home of eugenics, there never was any eugenics. But it turns on this idea of that we're born the way we are, and if it's not, that's not the way that we ought to be, we shouldn't be allowed to reproduce. Well, Darwin was a his, his cousin was a great, was a much greater scientist than uh, Galton, and he came up with a phrase which is very useful. I recommend anybody who teaches students to use it constantly. Um, Ignorance more frequently breeds confidence than does knowledge. <laughs> so if you don't know anything, you can be entirely confident. And Galton, to be frank, knew nothing. And he was entirely confident. Um, the, uh, the eugenicists of the 1930s knew nothing. And they were confident. And I hate to say it, but when the human genome was uh, read off 10 years and more ago now, uh, looking back, we knew nothing. And yet Tony Blair said, this is going to change the world. Not. It hasn't changed the world one tiny bit. Okay, or scarcely at all. So you have to be very, you have to be very um, um, uh, careful about what you mean. Okay, so the idea is still, around, is still with us. Here's a... Here's a uh, if, if you go to, the, uh, to Google and you type in the word scientists find the gene 4, you get something like 38,000 hits, which given that we've only got about 23,000 genes is rather a lot. Okay? Um, I should point out that tomatoes have got 26,000 genes. What that says about the, about the ability of the tomato, I don't know. Uh, but you can find things like emotional memory, fear, religiosity, sweet tooth, weight gain, language, uh, premature ejaculation is there, quite how it stays in quite a, how a gene for that would stay in a population, I don't know. Um, um, and there are more and more and more of these. And the idea that they're important is really still very much with us. Uh, what is it, how do we know that we found a gene for something? It might seem obvious, but in fact it's not. It's a very, very subtle statement. One obvious way that people might think is proof that an attribute is in the DNA, in the genes, is simply that it runs in families. Uh, but that isn't necessarily true. Um, here we have a man with a mild genetic disability in that his ears stick out, okay? Um, he has a, a consolation prize in that he is, prince, is or was Prince Andrew of Greece and of Denmark. He had a son, top right, Duke of Edinburgh, check out the ears. Um, his ears stick out. He, too, the Duke of Edinburgh, had a son, Prince Charles, with his customary look of baffled rage, even at the end of five, <laughs> even at the age of five. Check out his ears. Prince Charles, of course, had some children. There they are. Check out the ears of one of them, at least, if not the other. Uh, and you might argue, indeed, that that's some kind of evidence that there's a gene in the family which is passed from one generation to the next and half the children inherit it. Yes, well, maybe. And that's a kind of a very first hint that there might be genes involved. But inheritance itself certainly doesn't say anything about, uh, about, uh, about genetics or whether it's genetic or not. If you look at uh, Prince Charles's older son, Prince William, if everything goes according to plan, he, William, would inherit from Charles something which Charles inherited from his parent uh, and from um, all the way back for several hundred years, which is this, okay? Um, <laughs> which are the royal regalia. And they're, <clears throat> they're passed down the gen generations following rules as, uh, as rigid as those of Mendel, but there's no genes for crowns. So the simple statement of uh, the simple statement of um, of uh, finding gene finding inheritance is very very weak. So uh, something which there's no genes for crowns, there's no genes for wealth, there's no genes for speaking English. Um, we can go on about that. So that's fairly obvious. But there's a subtle spin on that, which is actually even when there are genes for a particular or predisposed towards a particular attribute, um, the environment is also involved. In fact, arguably the our environment is always involved. Here is a mutation in a cat, okay? And there's lots of cat genetics about. Um, in fact, the cat genome, the DNA of the cat, was sequenced about six or seven weeks ago, okay? So we know all about cats. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting things in cats. Darwin noticed that all blue-eyed cats are deaf. So, and he got it right, too, because all blue-eyed cats are deaf. That's to do with the melanin pigment. And this is a melanin mutation in cats. Now, melanin, of course, is a pigment, a black, dark pigment, 
which we all have, whatever our ancestors come from. Some people have slightly more than others and they have darker skin, but we all have plenty of melanin in our skin and our hair and in our brains and in various other parts of the body. Um, and uh, melanin is made, as most biochemical substances are, in a sort of factory with several uh, machines on an assembly line. Okay. And if your factory is working well, you, end up with a, you can end up with a black cat. If there is a, bro a breakage in one of the, complete breakdown in one of the machines in the assembly line, then the stuff gets made and then it's blocked there and you end up with a white cat, okay? So far, so simple. Now this particular melanin mutant is certainly genetic. We know exactly where in the melanin pathway where things have gone wrong. Um, and uh, if you do breeding experiments, it follows simple rules. We know really a great deal about the mutation. And it's a Siamese cat, and we all know about Siamese cat. They've got a black nose, ear, and tail. And if it's a gentleman cat, which this one is, or it's rather a shy gentleman cat, it's got black testicles as well. Okay. But the Siamese cat is interesting because it's the classic example of the interaction between nature and nurture of the interaction between a DNA change, which we understand in great detail, and an external agent. And in this case, the external agent, the environmental agent, is temperature. And uh, what's happened with this particular error is that it's damaged one of the machines in the assembly line, but only slightly, so that the, it could do its job in the relatively cold parts of the cat's body, where there's less energy, to use a, a, a phrase from physics, there's less energy zizzing about causing trouble. Okay, um, and if it's a high energy part of the part of the body, the warm part of the cat's body, then the thing can't do it. As you know, it's easier to dissolve sugar in tea, in hot tea, than cold tea. And this is just the same issue. If there's lots of molecules buzzing about, then the machine can't do its job. But in the relatively in the relatively uh, colder parts of the cat's body, it can. So the relatively cold parts of the cat's body, the ear, the nose, and the tail. And of course, the testicles, which are both literally and metaphorically the coolest part of any male body, um, then you can make black pigment. So the pattern is simultaneously nature and nurture. And you can alter it by breeding from relatively dark Siamese for many generations to make a slightly darker line of cats, or from breeding from relatively light Siamese cats for many generations in the hope of making a relatively light colored cat. Or you can keep your cat in a cold room. And here's a Siamese cat, which has been kept in a cold room. It's exactly the same mutation, of course, um, as the previous one. But because the temperature has been, is, has been lower, it can make more black pigment. Its surface is colder. Um, if you really want to show off, you can keep your cat in a refrigerator, and then you'll get a black cat, a very expensive black cat, with a Siamese struggling to get out. Okay? Um, if you want a relatively light-colored Siamese cat, keep it in a warm room. Exactly the same mutation again, but this time we've got the opposite effect. It's warm, so it can't make any pigment. There's a famous case of a kitten called Edward, whose proud owner shaved its initial on its side and kept it cold in, uh, with a little ice pack, um, and, uh, and uh, the kitten grew up uh, with the letter E on its side in perfectly natural black fur. Okay, so that is a statement that really you cannot separate nature and nurture. They're always intermingled. People often think that it's a bit like eating a cake, that somehow that some, it's a bit like a, a cake. You can dissolve what you are, your Siameseness or your intelligence or your criminality into a slice that's called nature and nurture, um, slice that's called nature, another one's called nurture. But you can't. You'd have to unbake the cake. Okay, and you can't unbake a cake, but you can. Oh, you can digest it, and I'll come back to that. And there are many, many cases um, exactly the same as the Siamese cat story in humans. Here's one which is mildly interesting to do with a, muta a mutation in humans, an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin convert angiotensin converting enzyme. And this is a classic example of nature and nurture in humans. It comes in two flavors. Something like um, one person in four in this room. We'll have a version that's called the insertion version. And you can see there, you know, it's got a, in red, it's got inserted into it an extra length of DNA. Okay, that's called the I version. And something like one in four, a bit less actually, will have two copies of the shorter version without that, in, that red blob stuck into it, and the rest of us have, will have one of each. Now, ACE is important because it's important, important in many ways. It does many different things in the body. But one of the things it's very much involved in is actually oxygen uh, uptake. Okay. 
And if, for example, you are in some terrible car crash or something like that, um, and uh, let's, uh, then it turns out that your ACE gene is quite important. Uh, if there is some awful accident, like a bus crash or a train crash, um, um, and uh, 15 or 50 people lying around groaning, uh, what doctors do, or the medical system in any country will do, is send in a crash team, as they call it, to deal with this, and they'll do triage, sorting in French, trier. Um, and what they do is they sort those who are still alive into three groups. Those who are in agony, but are not going to die, so they put those on one side. Those who are so badly injured that whatever you do to them, they are going to die. So you put those on one side. And then the crucial group, uh, those who are badly injured, but if you go in with all guns firing um, and really work on them, you may save some of them. Okay? Um, and there are various techniques that people use to do that, looking at the pupils of the eye, for example, asking about patterns of breathing. If you've got what's called chain stokes breathing, <gasps> panting like that, you're, 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 in, you're in more trouble. And a friend of mine, Hugh Montgomery, a surgeon, a trauma surgeon, um, has been working on the role of this particular gene in, that, in those circumstances. And it turns out that if you've got two copies of the longer form, you are much better with dealing with a low oxygen stress, for example, by your chest being crushed, shall we say, than if you've got two copies of the short form. And it hasn't yet become standard, but there are now attempts to take two such events, a little DNA chip that will tell the, uh, so the, the doctors within 10 minutes um, what the genes in the individuals involved have got, and maybe you'll pay more attention to the injured people who've got II rather than those who've got DD or who are less likely to survive. Well, it's an interesting gene, ACE, because it does all kinds of remarkable things. Um, my friend Hugh Montgomery is a keen climber, mountain climber. And he's one of these annoying uber mention. You know, he's climbed higher than anybody else and he's dived deeper than anybody else and he's got his own plane and he's written a million selling ch 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 children's book. I often, I'm often tempted to strangle him, actually. Um, <laughs> but um, one, one of his interests in life has, is climbing, and he genuinely is, or was, he's slightly older now, but he was one of the world's top amateur climbers, and he's climbed many, many of the Himalayas, and he's climbed Everest several times, but he, that's before Everest was, you know, Thomas Cook does Everest now, but, uh, but that's when Everest was still really quite a challenge, um, but he's never managed to climb it without oxygen. Okay, uh, and he began to look into why this was, and uh, he did a survey a few years ago asking, um, uh, who are the people who've managed to climb Everest without oxygen? And you can see that after you look at that top, at the top version of that graph, on the left, you see the top in A, you'll see the people who are II, the long version of the gene, are much more likely to have climbed Everest without oxygen than the, than the general population. And people who are DD, the short version of the gene, two copies, are much less likely to do so. And there's, a, there's an irony in this story because it turns out that Hugh Montgomery is in fact DD, so he will never climb up to Everest without oxygen. Okay. But that's a Siamese cat of an effect. It's nature and nurture. Um, the effect of the gene depends on the environment. Now, most of us presumably have already climbed Everest with or without oxygen um, or don't want to climb Everest, uh, but that has a wider implication. At the bottom there, we have some results from the US Army. And if you join the, an army, not something I necessarily recommend, obviously one of the things which, the first things that you have to experience is uh, some period of intense training and uh, physical training, okay? And one of the things which soldiers do um, is press-ups. Remember press-ups? God awful, bloody press-ups. Um, I haven't done a press-up since I was 16 and I never intend to do another one. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can do press-ups. And if you're relatively fit, if you're a relatively fit person, and relatively young, you can probably, with some effort, do press-ups for a minute or so, okay? Um, um, and, uh, but with training, you may be able to do better. But what's remarkable is that the extent to which you could do better is highly dependent on your, uh, on your ACE genotype. If you look at the lower square there, this is the increase in duration which you can do press-ups for in seconds. So if you're II, two copies of the long version, you can, get, you can go on for another minute and 20 seconds, which is really a lot. But if you're DD, I mean, forget it. You can go on for another five seconds, okay? And it can only be a matter of time, really, it seems to me, that be before people start screening potential soldiers, um, potential athletes, to ask what is their genotype in this uh, particular case.
Um, now, however, having said that, of course, it is still absolutely the case that the environment is involved. Um, if you can't do press-ups, who the hell cares if you're a, you know, a nerdy professor like me? We don't do press-ups, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, uh, only if you place yourself in an environment where you, are, uh, you need a lot of fitness is, is the gene important. Here's Mo Farah, of course, perhaps the best, best athlete in the world. It's not wild, widely known that Mo Farah has an identical twin. And Mo Farah came to Britain with his mother. His twin stayed in Somalia with his father. Mo came to Britain and went to a state school, was very quickly picked up as having extraordinary athletic abilities and became what he was, uh, one of the finest athletes in the world. Uh, he, he says that when he and his brother were young, they used to race each other. Um, and sometimes Mo would win, sometimes his brother would win. Now his brother is a car mechanic with no interest in sport. And if they were to race each other now, you can be absolutely sure that Mo Farah would win and his brother would, would not. And that is not dependent on the fact that they share all their genes in common. So let's go back to this cake analogy, which I rather leapt into a bit uh, too quick. Um, so here, that, they're, they're extreme cases. They're single genes with a big effect, but they're, uh, they're ir irrelevant to most of us. As I said, many people see the um, one's attributes, intelligence and the rest, as being like a cake which you can slice into a piece called nature and a piece called nurture. You can't do that. You'd have to unbake the cake. Or, alternatively, you could digest the cake. All right? And that's what digestion basically does. It gets back the carbohydrates and the proteins and the, and the amino acids which are in the cake. Okay. And here's a young lady about to do the experiment. All right? She's about to experiment on this important genetic phenomenon. Uh, if you do the experiment too frequently, what happens? You, <laughs> you get fat, all right? And I think many of us are aware of this in general terms, but we are now in the middle of an epidemic of, bad, of ill health, which is as important as some of the epidemics that spread through the world in the 19th, the 18th, the 17th centuries. Not the Black Death, but it's a very, very important epidemic, and that is the obesity epidemic, okay? And I want to explore that from the point of view of nature and nurture. And I'll show you some slides showing the proportion of American adults who are morbidly obese. Now, this is 30 pounds overweight for a person who's short, even shorter than me, five foot four, okay? So that's a lot of extra weight to be carrying for a five foot four person. And here we've got the figures from 1985, and uh, lots of states in 1985 we didn't have the records for, uh, but many we did. And I'll go through the years, and you'll see, as the, as, the, as the colors get warmer, you'll see what happened in this epidemic. So we start in 1985, where the states we've got records for, the majority of have got fewer than one person in 10 who are morbidly obese, and some have got um, between 10 and 14%. 1990... Suddenly, all of a sudden, a majority of states have got uh, um, uh, people who are obese, about one, by, about one in eight or more, 10 to 14 percent. 1995, a um, uh, majority of states just about, one in six, uh, more than one in six obese. 2000, we're getting to a situation where plenty of states are, are moving towards one in five. 2005, some states have got more than one in four. And by 2010, some states are, are, are turning towards one in three. Okay. Now, that's a major, major problem. Uh, we'll see in a moment that that actually causes uh, um, uh, lots and lots and lots of health um, issues. Um, and it's not a local problem. It's a very recent problem. That's what people find shocking. In 1980, it didn't exist. And when I lived in the States in the 70s, it scarcely existed. Now it's everywhere. So that's only about 40 years or so um, it's taken to shift the weight of the Americans. Every American puts on a pound a year since 1970. My God. Okay. Um, so there we, that, that's what the figures are. And it's not, it's not restricted to the United States. States because since 1985, a great tsunami of lard has washed across the Atlantic and, and broken upon European shores. Now, we in Britain have many things to be proud of, and one of the things we should be proudest of is that we are, in fact, the fattest country in Europe. <laughs> Here we have the thinnest, which is Romania, okay, so about one in, this is a slightly less uh, punitive measure of obesity, um, um, and that's understandable, but Switzerland is the second thinnest, 
Right down at the bottom here, rural Britannia, um, one in four of us is obese on this not quite so stringent measure. And that's well above the average, which is the EU, uh, about, one, about, about 15%. Um, and if you draw a rather more detailed map of British obesity, you end up with this, the fat map of the British Isles. And it's actually quite remarkable because, as you can see, that the obes obesity is concentrated in the poorest parts of Britain, in South Wales, where I come from, in, uh, in Tyneside, in Manchester and Liverpool. Um, you'll see that in the Tory voting svelte shires around London, you can see that Kent is fat. It doesn't vote. You know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's why they vote UKIP. Um, um, <laughs> you'll see there is very little obesity. So we we'll actually live in extraordinary times. We live in a time where, for the first time in history, the poor are fat and the rich are thin. So what's going on? Or what's this due to? Well, obviously, in some senses, um, this is due to a shift in the environment. Okay? Um, uh, and, and it's due, it's important because it leads to all kinds of health problems. It leads, in particular, to type 2 Diabetes and type two diabetes is the kind of diabetes that comes on um, uh, relatively late in, in life, and it's not like type one. Type one, as we all know, is an inborn inability to make insulin, which was always absolutely lethal until only about fifty years ago, when we began to be able to make insulin um, and inject it into the children. Now we can make it easily in bacteria, so these children uh, with no insulin uh, live more more or less normal lives, and that's great. Type two is different. It comes on later in life, and it comes on because you, have, you, have, you become obese, you have too much sugar, effectively, in your bloodstream, and your cells sort of stick up a barrier and say, we don't want any more sugar, we've got plenty, thanks very much. So your blood sugar level goes shooting up. And that leads to all kinds of problems. It leads to problems like, uh, like, uh, uh, like um, ulcers on the skin, um, skin prone to, prone to infections. Uh, that's a bit of an understatement. Um, uh, those ulcers often lead to the amputation of arms or legs as the disease goes on. It leads to muscle problems, heart disease, uh, 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 poor eyesight, depression, um, kidney problems, all kinds of problems. A large number of dialysis patients have got type 2 diabetes. Okay. And it's the worst kind of illness to have an epidemic of um, because it's, uh, it's expect it takes a long time to die, to put, it r r to put it roughly. The kind of disease that public health systems love are things like heart attacks. They're just great because it's, a binary, it's ba gen basically a binary system. You're, you're tr trotting around saying, hello clouds, hello sky, one minute, and the next minute you're dead. So all you have to do is to pay for the ambulance to come and pick you up, and that's it. Um, but this is quite different. Um, this comes on in early or middle adulthood and can continue for 30 or 40 years, uh, getting more and more uh, ill until finally you pass away. And the shocking statistic is that one teenager in three in Texas has got signs of early onset diabetes. Now that's going to, the US health system is already in a mess and this is going to ruin it, there's no question. So how can we predict what our chances of this condition are. Well, it's actually rather simple. All you need to do is take a tape measure and measure your waist size, okay? Now, it's good that I can talk to this audience because when I'm talking to a young audience, I have to say, um, I'm a scientist and I don't use inches, but I actually, I can't think in centimeters at all. I just use inches. <laughs> um, so let's look at men, given that I'm a man, and my waist size, I'm not particularly proud to say, is, is size, I take 32 inch trousers, okay? So put me there. If you have a waist uh, circumference just eight inches more, your risk of type 2 diabetes goes up by 16 times, okay? For women, it's even worse. A slim woman will have a waist size of around 29 or less. If you add eight inches to that, the risk of type 2 diabetes goes up by 35 times. So this is a big, big issue. And the question, and people are very, very interested in exploring why this has become such an enormous problem. Well, in some senses, it is, of course, environmental. It, it's um, it's uh, the cost of food has dropped dramatically. These are these are U.S. figures. I haven't managed to find the British figures, but the figures are about the same. Um, in the nineteen in the nineteen thirties, the average working man in the and it would have been a man in those days in the U.S. would have to work for about five hours a day in order to get enough money to feed himself, his wife, and two children. That's now gone down to about one and a half to two hours a day. 
So that's because food has got much cheaper. Well, you might argue that's a good thing, but of course the kind of food that got much cheaper isn't necessarily such a good thing at all. Because again, American figures, it's slightly out of date, but I haven't managed to find any uh, more recent ones. You can see that things like uh, fats and oils, sugars and sweets, and overwhelmingly soft drinks have got much, much cheaper. And if I took this to 2015, soft drinks would be down here. I mean, if you, go to, uh, if you go to Waitrose, as of course we all do, we wouldn't be seen dead anywhere else, would we? Um, you can buy a full fat, as it were, a full sugar litre bottle of Coca-Cola for less than some fizzy waters. And that's amazing. There are 26 teaspoons, 26 tablespoons full of sh sugar in every litre of Coca-Cola. Okay, the things which have got actually more expensive are things like fresh fruit and vegetables and things of that na things of that, that nature, which are actually good for you. So you could argue that this is entirely environmental, and certainly to a degree, it's very hard to argue with that, to disagree with that. However, it's also the case that this runs in families. Um, you know, this, this is the sugar consumption. Uh, here's a, a family in which it runs. I think they're probably an American family, um, both mother and father morbidly obese, the daughter going that way rather quickly, and you could argue, well, it runs in a family, it must be genetic. But no, of course, uh, one of the proof that it isn't genetic is in the next slide, because this is a picture of their cat. <laughs> and it's one, of the, uh, it's one of the less familiar facts of modern genetics, and I can assure you it's true that fat people have fat cats. Um, <laughs> And they have fat dogs, they have fat goldfish, and that isn't because they share genes with their cat, at least I hope they don't. Um, they, they feed themselves too much, they feed their children too much, and they feed their cat too much, okay? So that is an inherited environmental agent. We've seen a fat cat, let's look at a fat mouse. Now, this is an interesting mouse, because this mouse has a mutation in a gene which, uh, which not surprisingly, is called the obese mutant. And it turned up, it must be a long time ago now, it must be 15 years ago, um, uh, it turned up 15 years ago in a laboratory stock, um, and if you've got two copies of this gene, uh, uh, you get morbidly obese. And this animal is morbidly obese. It's kept in its cage, treated well, um, and uh, it gets as fat as this. Very occasionally, very occasionally indeed, um, children are born with this condition. And here we have a picture of a boy, young boy, uh, missing the hormone involved. It's a hormonal um, thing called leptin. And uh, the young boy, as you can see, is missing the hormone on the left. That's before treatment. And afterwards, the, he's been injected, given leptin treatment, and it's more or less cured. And leptin is what we call a satiety hormone. We're all familiar with the sensation of hunger, and that's a hormonal sensation. Um, I have to say, I'm, uh, I'm enjoined by my employ employers at UCL to put in an advertising break um, every half an hour into my lectures about how wonderful UCL is. And in fact, the very first uh, hormones were discovered at UCL, and they were appetite hormones. Okay. So insulin is uh, an appetite hormone. When your blood sugar drops, when it drops, the insulin tells you, go out and get a cheeseburger, go out and get a Coca-Cola, okay, and you do it. But less familiar is the notion of satiety, that you go and get your cheeseburger, you might even have two cheeseburgers, but you don't have ten, because you have a separate series of hormones, leptin being one of them, and there are others called ghrelin and the like, which say, okay, enough is enough, you don't want any, any, you don't want any more food. This bloke, this kid, and the mouse, are missing leptin, so if there's any food available, they're hungry all, hungry all the time, and this boy, without question, it's hellish for their parents, because their baby is genuinely starving, hungry all the time, and screams and begs for food, and it's very hard to turn him down. Um, and that's because he perceives himself as not having eaten enough. Um, and, uh, but this is only important where there's plenty of food. For a wild mouse, for example, or it doesn't live in a nice warm laboratory cage with tons of food, um, if you've got a leptin deficiency, it doesn't make any difference, it doesn't make much difference because you're not going to be able to find enough food to get fat. If you were to go back to the days of hunger in Britain, it would be just the same. If you had leptin deficiency, too bad, you'd be hungry, but you'd stay hungry because you wouldn't find enough food. So it is a nature-nurture thing. However, things in the last couple of years have become rather more tangled. Um, here's a mutation in a mouse. It's, an, it's like, it's, it's, it's the Prince Charles mutation to some extent, because check out his ears, all right? Uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to particularly talk about the ears. I'm going to talk about another mutation, which our friend Mickey, 
widely used to sell junk food, needless to say. Our friend Mickey has got this mutant. If you look at his, his hands, he's only got three fingers and a thumb on each hand. And presumably, although he's rather shy about his feet, he's only got three toes and a big toe on his feet. And there is a mutation in mice called FTO, which stands uh, uh, plonkingly for fused toes. Um, and if you've got this mutation in mice, you get to your, to your toes fused together. So big deal, I hear you say. Well, fair enough, big deal. It, if you find the mutation in mice or any other creature, you can search for it and find it very readily in the human genome. It would take you five seconds. You type it in, to, you have to type it in, but you type it in, and there it is. We have the same gene. And we have the same error as what causes fused toes in mice. But bizarrely, in humans, the fused toes error in mice does something completely different because it's an appetite gene. Okay? That just reminds me how little we know about genetics. What the hell is going on there? Nobody knows. Okay? So um, about a third of the people in this room have got two copies of the amino acid, uh, of the, base, the DNA base called A, at a particular site in this really rather large gene, uh, just one DNA uh, change. About a third, a bit less actually, have got two copies of T, and the rest of us are intermediate. Now, if you're AA, you weigh on average about two kilograms more than somebody like me, who is TT, okay? So this gene was discovered, and people assumed that it was something to do with your digestive system, and so on, but it isn't. It's actually a gene uh, that's active, like many others involved in this issue, and that's just one of many such genes that we now know. Where are they active? They're active in the brain, okay? We know many genes like this now. Uh, they don't work in the digestive system. Um, they don't work in the immune system. Uh, they work in the brain, and that's where, that's where the issues is. It's appetite. Some people quite genuinely have a much bigger appetite than others, and in an environment where they can satisfy that appetite, they're at much, much greater um, uh, danger of, um, of obesity. So the cure, if there is a cure, is to eat less. I remember, um, I remember uh, Sidney Brenner, who's, who was the cleverest of the Watson Crick Brenner Benzer group. I mean, Brenner's got a brain like a planet. He's still around. And Sidney telling me once, you know, they say they found the gene for obesity. I know what the gene for obesity is, and only for years, it's the one that makes you open, it, you open your mouth. Um, and he was dead right. We didn't realize how right he was. But that's it is. It's a hunger gene. So that's what lies behind this particular very important epidemic. Um, the uh, gene, which has been around for years, um, now is in an environment where those at risk can actually succumb to the risk, become obese, get diabetes, and die young. Now that actually kind of argument happens again and again, and I don't want to keep repeating the case. Let me talk um, for uh, briefly about one of Galton's real obsessions, which had to do with crime. And Francis Galton, if you ever see the phrase in a scientific paper, it is easy to show that. You know there's something very weird going on, <laughs> because nothing is easy to show. Galton was convinced that it was easy to show that the criminal nature tends to be inherited. And in some senses, he's certainly right, um, because the strongest predictor that a boy will go, or a person will go to prison, is that if his or her, uh, if, his, if his father has been to prison. And in that sense, it's, clearly, it's inherited. But clearly, again, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's uh, not quite as simple as that. So that's Galton's statement. And Galton did all kinds of strange things. These are Galton's composite photographs. And what Galton did was get a whole pile of burglars and a whole pile of muggers and a whole pile of, of check fraud, um, of, of, of uh, plastic card cheats, and take pictures of them with a, an early camera and print them all together on the same plate. Okay, first person to do that, a composite picture. And he hoped he, hoped he would get an ideal burglar and an ideal mugger. Um, but as you can see, it didn't really work. They all just looked like thugs, really. Okay? Um, uh, so, and he had the decency to say it didn't work. But people, that argument has gone much, much further now. Um, and here's one of the ways in which genetics has played a part in it. Uh, here we have a, uh, an example of what I sometimes think of as molecular phrenology. Phrenology being, of course, feeling your bumps to see whether you're musical or whether you're a criminal and so on. Now we just feel the bumps, but we use very, very expensive machines uh, uh, to scan the brain and effectively do the same thing. 
And there's a lot of very strange stuff goes on. You know, if you think holy thoughts, this bit lights up. If you think sexual thoughts, that bit lights up. If you listen to Mozart, this bit. If you listen to the Sex Pistols, that bit. Um, you know, it's, it's all a bit strange. Um, and many of, but many of those things are very, very hokey indeed, although that lots of money is being spent on them. But one of them, which is probably quite dependable, turns on this uh, little segment of the bottom, back base of the brain called the amygdala. And that actually means... That actually means the, uh, it's a nut, an amygdala. Um, and it's uh, in what's sometimes rather foolishly called the lizard brain, the primitive part of the brain, uh, deep down below the conscious part, which is the cortex at the top. Um, and what the amygdala does is light up under conditions which are um, alarming. And we know that because of a series of experiments which really, I would say, were not ethical, but people did them anyway. I probably wouldn't get away with them now, which was to get a pile of students and pay them some sum of money, 20 quid, to sit in one of these machines and have their brain scanned. And you tell the students, well, we're going to do uh, a scan of your brain to see whether different parts of your brain respond to, shall we say, uh, different flower colors. So we're going to show you a rose, we're going to show you a dandelion, we're going to show you an apple flower, we're going to show you a magnolia flower, and, um, yeah, and we're just going to look at your brain, and you just think, think, you look and th think about these flowers. And the student's lying there with this machine making a terrible noise going around his head, thinking, oh, God, this is boring. At least I'm getting paid. And then suddenly, without any warning, is inserted a picture of some horrible event, somebody being decapitated or a terrible car crash or somebody with an awful deformity with no warning at all. Um, and then the poor student um, immediately thinks, oh my God, what was that? That's not a flower, Jesus Christ. Um, and what happens is that the amygdala lights up, okay? And the extent to which it lights up is shown the bit here from scarcely any lighting up to a lot of lighting up. And here we go, uh, different, uh, different, um, different parts of the, uh, different pictures of the same thing. And it turns out that the extent to which it does this depends on a particular system of genetic variation, which is certainly, like the uh, obesity thing, is certainly present in this room. It turns on the activity of a particular uh, variant, an enzyme called MAOA, monoamine oxidase A. Um, and to put it crudely, I think we know more about it than this, it comes in two flavors, okay? Uh, well, let's just look at the males here. It comes in um, people with, uh, some people have very low monoamine oxidase A activity, some people have very high monoamine mono oxidase activity. And if you zap people um, with this nasty shock, this picture of the decapitation, and you look at the extent to which that part of the brain lights up, there's a dramatic difference between those with low activity and those with high. If you've got low activity, you have much more of a response, much more of a sudden response of horror and emotion when you see this than if you have high activity. And I can tell you that I myself have very low um, MAOA activity. So no difficult question, please. You might actually, re <laughs> you might regret it. Um, um, and I know that uh, in several ways. One of the, one of the uh, ways, and some of you may share my problem, I find it very difficult to drink red wine because if I do, I have dreadful nightmares and sometimes I shake. I find it impossible to eat soft cheese for the same reason. I don't eat cheese at all. Uh, simply because it makes me sweat, it makes me feel tense, and that's a well-known phenomenon. There are certain anti antidepressants, for example, which if you take them, and I don't, you, you are told not to eat red wine and uh, soft, and eat, uh, not to drink red wine and eat soft cheese, because it has to do with this, uh, this monoamine oxidase enzyme, which is involved in breaking uh, stuff called tyramine down. Okay. But I know the effect on its emotion, on emotion, in, uh, 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 in a different and rather alarming way. Something like 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now, when I first moved into my house, in, our house in Camden Town, um, next door, as it happened some years later, to Amy Winehouse, which, um, although alas, she's no longer there, uh, I was walking up on a lovely May evening up the, up the little, little few steps to the house, um, and I was attacked from behind by two guys uh, who started beating me up. And I thought, this is very irritating. And there's a black guy and a white guy, actually. And I went completely crazy. Um, I'm, to my horror, I went completely mad. I hit one of them. I have to tell you, I hit the white person, so I'm a good person, really. <laughs> and, 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 and I hit him hard on the nose, broke his nose, broke my finger, still remains broken, um, and then went completely apeshit, screamed and yelled and chased them down the road, um, yelling, stop them, stop them, and was joined by somebody else. And then we went past a bus queue, and they all looked at us. I said, get him! 
And then they disappeared and it all ended in fiasco. And the next morning, and I was badly shaken. I was genuinely badly shaken. I went to hospital, was bound up, came back. Um, and I was badly shaken. And the next morning, to my horror and dismay, I was going to, I was still pretty shaken. Um, I, pick, I was going to work and I thought, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll pick up this kitchen knife and if I see one of those guys, I'll kill them. And I thought, what the hell are you doing, you know? <laughs> What the hell are you doing? Um, and so I put it down and calmed down, and I haven't broken anybody's nose since, um, in spite of the difficult questions they insist on asking me. All right? <laughs> and, and that's a real phenomenon. And this phenomenon, having a low activity in this gene, has been used, or at least people have tried to use it, in criminal cases. There's a famous case you may have heard of uh, long, many years ago now, 2003, Stephen Mo no, 1993, Stephen Mobley, who was a murderer in the States. And in the States, as of course you know, in the late 1970s, the death penalty was brought back um, and uh, different states of the Union used different trial mechanisms. And the state of Georgia, where Mobley had killed several people, he was a dreadful man, he was a, he was a guy who attacked um, Domino Pizza sh store shops with a pistol in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, that's what you expect if you go to a Domino Pizza shop in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, the people behind the counter are told if anybody holds the damn holds you up, give them the money. And uh, so they gave him the money, but uh, what Mobley did was just kill them anyway, and he killed at least five people. And he was very quickly picked up um, and imprisoned and charged with multiple murder. And he was found, and he admitted it, he was clearly guilty, he was found guilty. But the state of Georgia had a very rather odd system whereby there were two trials. There was the guilt phase trial and the penalty phase trial. And the guilt phase trial, in this case, was straightforward. It was absolutely clear that he was guilty. But then came the penalty phase. And the penalty phase is with a different jury and a different judge who decides whether or not the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the death penalty should be applied. Okay. Um, and uh, it so happened that at just that time, a paper appeared in the journal Science which became very notorious, you may remember it perhaps, about this particular system of variation, monoamine oxidase A, to do with a Dutch family um, in Nijmegen in Holland, where not, not, they didn't just have low activity, they had no activity of this enzyme. And many of the young men in this Dutch family with uh, no activity had got into terrible trouble with the law. They'd, uh, they'd set fire to buildings, they'd stabbed people, they'd been in dreadful fights. Um, and uh, Mobley's attorneys actually rang me up, what well, God where they rang me up, about this paper and said, we're going to use this as a defence. It wasn't me that did it, it was me DNA, okay? And this led to a big shock to the American legal system because, you know, it's a kind of defence. It is a defence. If you hear voices that tell you to murder that man because he's the devil, they will treat you differently than if you decide to murder that man in order to steal his Rolex watch. So it seemed that there might be something in this. And it went on and on. It's a long, long story. Um, and it, it, uh, and it, it, it ended up with him failing. Not before, rather in brackets, and I'll stop rambling in a second, not before that after about six months of the trial going on, um, Mobley's father, who was paying these lawyers, suddenly realised that if his son was a criminal because of his genes, no M, no, no, I mean oxidase, oxidase A, he must have inherited it from his father. And that was libelous. So he sued his son's lawyers <laughs> for libelling him the father. And the lawyers were just completely amazed by this um, until they walked off the case and said, well, the hell with you, we're not going to go along with this. And Mobley, in the end, disastrously because of the, I hate the death penalty, was executed. So you might say, well, that's a very strange thing, that there is a gene for crime. And it would be simplistic to say there's a gene for crime, but of course there's a gene that predisposes towards crime for those people who are unlucky enough to inherit it. It makes a hormone. Um, this is it, testosterone. Okay, um, and this is the hormone testosterone. We all have testosterone, well, we may not know it, um, both men and women, but men have much more. Women have small amounts of testosterone, which is why elderly ladies sometimes grow rather charming moustaches. Um, <laughs> well, that's the testosterone. But men have much more. And testosterone is kind of dangerous stuff. Here we have... <laughs> <coughs> Uh, a student once came up to me after this lecture and said, have you not been well, Professor Jones? <laughs> <laughs> I have never looked like this. Although this, although this is Steve Jones, who was the 2007 Pan Pacific bodybuilding champion. 
Now, I don't know whether Steve Jones does this, but plenty of bodybuilders do. They inject themselves with testosterone to make themselves more into an ideal male. And ladies, this is what we all men really want to look like. They've got big, hefty muscles, a truculent and bad-tempered expression, obviously in search of a mate of some kind. Um, and uh, I think you'll agree, a rather impressive posing pouch there. But, um, and, but if you do that and you inject testosterone, your life expectancy drops quite strikingly. You're much more liable to be killed in car crashes, in fights, to be murdered, to commit suicide. All these male things happen much more among testosterone abusers. But it's true also for the men among us. Here's the patterns of life and death for men and women at different ages. As you can see, from 0 to 80 at the bottom, mortality rate up the vertical axis. And at the top left, you can see the men in blue, women in red. Men die at a higher rate than women at all ages. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, and you, can, you can dissect that a bit. If you look at the bottom left, accidental death, men die in accidents at a much higher rate than women do. Four-year-old boys are killed in accidents at twice the rate of four-year-old girls. And the effect gets even more striking when you get to be a young adult. It is the case, and many people dispute this, but it is in fact true, that men are struck by lightning at three times the rate of women. <laughs> and that's not because there's a gene that attracts thunderbolts. That's because they do those male things about going onto a golf course with a lightning conductor in their hand <laughs> or climbing up a mountain to show how masculine they are and zap, they get hit. Interestingly, on the bottom right there, uh, men are much less good Damn it, men are much less good at dealing with parasitic and infectious diseases because one of the effects of, of testosterone is to suppress the immune system. Uh, that, rather than in brackets, is why women have more autoimmune diseases where the immune system turns upon itself, um, like, multi, like multiple sclerosis. And most of all, men are murdered much more than women are. Okay? But men get their own back because they murder much more than women do. <laughs> And here's the murder rate in England and Wales. Men in red this time, just to be awkward, women in blue. And you can see that the murder rate by men is 10 times what it is by women. It peaks at about the time when a young man is trying to show what a wonderful husband he'd make at the age of 25, or trying to get rid of the opposition. Some grumpy old men here, I know exactly, <laughs> I know exactly how they feel. And that 10 times difference is universal. The murder rate across the world varies by 100 times, from Singapore, where it's very low, to Honduras, where it's 100 times more common. But it's still a 10 times difference between men and women. For example, in the city of Detroit, we have exactly the same pattern, although elderly men are more grumpy, okay? A 10 times difference, a peak at the age of 25. So you might say, well, here we have the gene for murder, for crime. And you'd be absolutely right. You definitely do have the gene for murder and for crime. But hang on a minute, look at the vertical axis. The murder rate per million per year in Detroit goes up to 1,000. The murder rate per million per year in the United Kingdom is between 20 and 25. It's come down from these figures now. So what that's telling you is that a particular gene predisposes those men, as we call them, to violence, but only manifests itself, like the Siamese cat, in a certain environment. If you're in an environment like Detroit, where you're surrounded by poverty, by drugs, by gangs, by police brutality, all these things, then there will be a massive murder rate. If you're in somewhere like Britain, and even more so in Singapore, which is a relatively, relatively equitable society, that's much more likely. So we've got a situation then that some people, because of their own heritage, are at more, uh, uh, at more danger of becoming murderers and being murdered because of the environment in which they live. So that really tells you but the idea that you can separate out nature and nurture for murder or anything else is completely foolish. Or to put it in a broader context, it also tells you that science will tell you everything you need to know about yourself apart from the interesting stuff. So I'll stop there. Thank you.